6, 7, and 8. And we're going to do part 2 of a message I started last week. Psalms 6, 7, and 8. All right, Psalms 6, 7, and 8. You know, as you read the morning newspaper and you look around in the world today, it can kind of lead you to ask the question, why did God put life on planet Earth? Uh, you know, you look around at the atrocities that are committed on the earth and you think, man, why did God put life on the earth? I uh, went on a, uh, news, a news source this morning on the web, just a news channel, and I just wrote down a few headlines. Th- these are the headlines, okay, for this morning around the world. Afghan homicide bomber targets foreign troops. Next headline, Israel threatens retaliation over rocket attacks. Next headline, Inmates at Texas prison riot and take over compound. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. The next one, 111, 111 people dead in Kenya, gasoline blaze. Seven tourists killed in Arizona tour bus crash. Here's one. A boy 11 years old is questioned in the death of a 7-year-old child in Ohio. And, you know, you, you look at this stuff and you think, what in the world? Why is there life on this earth? What was God thinking? Well... We know what he was thinking. We know why he created what he created. You say, how do we know? The Bible tells us. In Colossians, up on the screen, 1.16. In Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him, and the him is Jesus Christ. For by him were created all things that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now look at this. All things were created, next two words, by him, by Christ, But then what's the next three words? And for him. Why was everything created that was created? It was created for Jesus Christ. It was created so that there might be a forum in which which the Son of God could be glorified. The only one worthy of glory. The only one worthy to be magnified. The the heavens, the earth, uh, mankind, all of this was created so that they might bring glory and point to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the question, though, that sounds great, but why is there so much evil on the earth? And that's the question up on the screen here that we pondered last week. Why is there so much evil on the earth? If we could bring that up, please, the next thing. Uh, Can we please go to the next screen, please? Okay, that's okay. All right, let's, let's go to that. All right, look in your handout. And it says that God has a glorious what? Purpose for the earth for the heavens, and for mankind. So last week we began to consider this question, why is there so much evil on the earth then? Why is there so much evil on the earth? And, and we spent last Sunday morning looking at this question, and really I was thinking, okay, how am I going to review this this morning? And I thought, you know what the easiest way for me to review this point is to put a verse on the screen. I think this verse summarizes why there's so much evil on the earth. It says, wherefore, as by one man, what came into the world, folks? Sin. Sin entered into the world. And and what was the result of sin entering the world? Death. Death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You say, why is there so much evil on the earth? When God created Adam, he created Adam and Eve, not sinners. He created them innocent. He created them innocent, but yet Adam and Eve willfully chose to sin and to rebel against God and His Word. When they did that, sin entered into this universe. Sin entered onto this earth. Sin brought a curse on the earth, and it brought a curse on mankind. You say, why is there so much evil on the earth? Well, really the bottom line is, it's because of mankind's rebellion against the Word of God. We saw last week, over and over, God gave His Word, and mankind rebelled and said, Ah, we don't need that. And over and over, we see that mankind has chosen to believe Satan's lie program instead of believing what the Word of God has to say. And when you choose the lie program over what God's Word says, what's the result going to be? Well, the result's going to be those headlines that I read you a few minutes ago. Whenever you choose Satan's word over God's word, that's where you're going to have evil and that's where you're going to have wickedness. So we look at that and we think about that and really the question then is, is there any hope for this earth? I mean, we, 
The, the one person that could straighten this earth out was the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to the earth. He's the Messiah. He's the one that wants to bring in a glorious kingdom on the earth. What does the world do? The world takes the word of life, the word made flesh, and they hang him on a cross, and they reject him, and they crucify him. And then what happens? Three days later, he what? He rose again. But did he stay on the earth? No, 40 days after he rose from the dead, where did he ascend to? He ascended back up to heaven. So now the, the one who could straighten out this mess is gone. He's left the earth. He's back up in heaven. So the question then is, is there any hope left for this earth? And that's a subject you get a variety of answers. Um, I encourage you sometime at work, if you really want to kind of just stir the pot a little bit around the water cooler... Uh, ask the question at work, hey, do you think there's any hope for this earth? And if people say, well, yeah, say, well, what do you think it is? Interesting responses you'll get. Um, some people will probably say, I think education's the answer. They'll, they'll reason if people are better educated, they'll behave better, and the earth will become a nicer place. Some people will say, I think religion's the answer. If everyone had some form of religion, doesn't matter what it is, if they just had some kind of form of some religion, then the world, uh, then they'll behave better and the world will be a better place. Some people say, no, environmental consciousness is the answer to saving the earth. Some people say, well, if we just could eradicate poverty, that holds the key. Some would say, I believe better government will solve the answers. Some say, no, I think the hope of this earth is a global economy and I think peace initiatives between the nations. And if we can just get all that worked out, then, then you know, the world will just be a great place. Well, you know, here's the bottom line. All of that stuff is man's opinions and they have been tried in various ways and failed. No matter how hard man tries to solve the problems of evil, war, injustice on the earth... He just can't seem to find the key to be able to unlock the solution. So, you know what I think we ought to do? I think we ought to say, what does God's Word say about this? What does God have to say about the hope of this earth? Now, as you go to Psalm 6, you see David last week, a man who knew about evil. He knew about injustice on the earth. Um, We saw it in Psalm 6 and a little bit in Psalm 7. But did you know that even though David knew all about uh, um, you know, the, the, the righteous suffering and the evil and the wicked seemingly getting away with it. Even though David knew about injustice, he knew about persecution, he knew about the righteous suffering, even though he, he knew all that and experienced it firsthand, David also knew there was an answer. And, and, and here's the thing, in your handout, it says that David knew that the answer was direct intervention from the Lord himself. He knew that the problems of the earth could only be solved by direct intervention from the Lord Himself. Look at Psalm 6 and go down to verse 4. He says, and what's the very first word? I just love the 11 o'clock service. You guys are so alive and chipper and happy. Aren't y'all happy? Yeah. Yeah, and you guys are just so alive and chipper, and you know, in, in, in the nine thirty service, sometimes they're a little tired in that service, and you know, they didn't get that extra hour of sleep that you guys got. So sometimes I'll say, "What's that first word in verse four? And it'll be like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you guys are like, "Return." Verse 4, return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. Go down to chapter 7 there, Psalm 7, verse 1. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Notice he's in all this turmoil. But he says, save me from all of them that persecute me and deliver me. Go, how's God going to do that? Look down at verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. Lift up thyself because... Of the rage of mine enemies. And awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Now look at verse 7. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about. For their sakes therefore. And what's the last phrase there? Return thou on high. You see David knew. That if the problems of this earth. Would have any hope of solution. He knew that it would take. He knew that the Lord would have to intervene. 
if things were to be made right on planet Earth. Man isn't going to figure it out, okay? Man's not going to figure it out, how to solve all the solutions of, of evil and war and injustice. Man's not going to figure out how to make the earth this utopia place that's perfect and there's no more injustice and there's no more evil and there's no more wickedness and there's no more war. Mankind's not going to figure out the solution to that, okay? Now listen, I hate to disappoint you, but Obama's not going to figure all that out. Nor did George Bush... Nor did the guy before him, nor did the guy before him, okay? Now listen, I'm just telling you the hard, cold facts here that that mankind, I don't care who the man is, he's not going to figure out the solution to all the evil and injustice and and the hatred and and, and the, the, the violence and the wickedness of the earth. Psalm 7 is a prophetic psalm, see? And it's prophesying of a time... When the Lord, it says in your handout, when the Lord will return and He's going to bring judgment upon the wicked. And all of prophecy points to that day when the Lord will return. We just read about that. Now, real quickly, let me, let me make sure that we understand this. Jesus Christ came to this earth the first time. And when He came to this earth... Okay, he came as a baby. He was born... Where, where, where did he enter into the earth? Now, come on, folks. If anyone ought to know where he was born, this church ought to know where Christ entered the world. All right? <laughs> it's almost gone, isn't it, out there? Bethlehem's almost history here. But, but, yeah, I mean, come on. Where did he enter? Bethlehem. That's right. You're like, this is a trick question. No, it's not a trick question. He entered Bethlehem. And when he came, the Bible says he came meek and lowly. The Bible says when he came the first time, he came as a lamb to die on the cross, to lay down his life for the sins of mankind. He gave himself a ransom for all, the Bible says. You say, why did he do that? He did that so there could be a way for God to justly forgive us of our sins. You see, by him dying on the cross, he was the righteous one. He was dying for the unrighteous. He was godly, dying for the ungodly. He was sinless, dying for the sinner. There he took our place. He took the death that sin, the payment. What, what's the payment for sin? We read it earlier. Death. He took our death. He took the payment so that you and I could be justly forgiven, so that God could take all the righteousness on his account, put it on our account, and take our sin and put that on Christ's account. You see, God did that, and Christ had to die in order that you and I might be saved and forgiven of all of our sins. And aren't you glad that he died, amen? He shed his blood for us. He died for the ungodly. Now, hold on a second, though. The Bible says he came and he died as a lamb. We sung earlier, hallelujah, praise the lamb. He's the Lamb of God. He, he gave himself as a lamb. Well, but wait a minute. In your handout, it says Christ is one day going to return to the earth, but not as a gentle lamb. He's going to come back down to this earth, folks. He's not coming via Bethlehem. He's not coming as a lamb. The second time, it says in your handout, he's coming as a furious lion to judge and make war with the ungodly. So the first time, he's called a lamb. The second time, he's called a lion. Now, do we all understand the difference between a lamb and a lion? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lamb's just this innocent creature, you know? And a lion is ferocious. A lion will, 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 will be able to tear and rip. A, li- a lamb's just, you know, just this innocent creature. Well, he's coming the second time as a lion. Look at the screen, Revelation nineteen eleven, And notice it says, And I saw heaven open, John said. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's Christ. And in righteousness, notice when he comes back, when heaven opens and he returns, what's the two things he's coming to do? He doth judge. And what's the second thing? You say, who's he going to make war with? Well, that's where I'm going to take you to the screen again and look at Jude 14 and 15, and you'll see see who he's going to make war with. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, notice what Enoch saw in a vision. He saw the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. Well, what was he coming to do? To execute what? Judgment. Judgment. Well, on who, though? 
upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's coming to execute judgment the second time as a lion. Now, there's one other passage just to show you that Paul, the, our apostle Paul, taught the same thing. Look at this passage, 2 Thessalonians 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking what? Vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When Jesus Christ comes back, let's review. The first time he came, he came as a what? A lamb. To do what? To, to die. That's right, for us. The second time he comes to the earth, he's coming as a lion. What's he going to do? He's going to judge. That's right, he's going to make war with the ungodly. Now, go to Psalm 7 and look at verse uh, 9. It says... Oh, let the wickedness... Notice that when Christ returns here in this prophetic psalm, what happens? Verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. But notice what he's going to do. Establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. In your handout, it says that when Christ returns, number one, the wickedness of the wicked comes to an end. Okay, you got that? Number two, the just are established. Those who have been justified before God will be established. So he's going to come and establish the just, but he's going to judge the wicked. And uh, verse 11 talks about how God is angry with the wicked every day. Now verse 12 is an absolute key verse. Everybody look down at verse 12. It says, if he, the wicked, turn not, they won't turn to the Lord. They won't turn to God's provision. If the wicked turn not, Then he, God, will wet his sword, he hath bent his bow, and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. And verses 14 through 17 describe for you what's going to happen to the wicked when he returns. Now, look up here just a moment, and I want you to get this. Okay, God said, if you won't turn to me, if the wicked won't choose to turn from their their sin, they won't choose to turn to the Lord and turn to God's provision, then he says, all right, he says, I'm just warning you. He said, I've got my my bow bent, okay? I've got my sword wetted and it's ready to go. And so what is God doing? God in his grace gives mankind space to turn to him. Notice he said, if he turn not, if he turn not, God said, this is what I'm going to do. Aren't you glad we got a God of grace who gives us space to turn to Him? And and today God has made a way for us to be just or to be justified before Him today. God has made a way for you and I to be made right before Him. You say, how? It's through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, okay, let me see it. Look at Romans 3.28 on the screen. Let's bring it up. It says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by joining the church. Is that what it says? No. A man is justified, made right with God. How about by getting dunked in water? Will that work? How about if I come and maybe, you know, do this over Larry? Will that do it? You know, if I come and do the incantation over Larry, will that, will that justify him? No. Bible says we conclude that a man is justified by what? Faith. Well, faith. Without the deeds of the law. It's nothing I can do. It's just faith. Faith in what? Look at the next verse. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's through my faith in who that I'm justified? The Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you ever completely, exclusively relied on Him? Or are you trusting religion? Are you trusting in your good works? Are you saying, well, I think I'll go to heaven. Why? Well, I got baptized years ago. I'm a good person. No, no, no. The Bible says that we are just, God's giving us time. He's giving us space to turn to Him before He returns in judgment. 
But when we turn to Him, it's not that I turn to Him with my self-righteousness. I don't turn to Him with all my religious achievements. I humble myself and I turn to Him and I cast myself on the provision that He made for me. And that's His Son dying for my sins on the cross. And when I turn to Him and I trust Him and Him alone, God says, I'm justified. I'm made right with Him. So let's go back to our original question. Okay, is there any hope for the earth that we live on? Yes or no? Absolutely there's hope. If you don't get anything else today, I hope you'll get that. Okay? And and I wish I'd have heard hundreds of yeses just then. Is there hope for this earth? And that hope is a person. That hope is a person. It's Jesus Christ. In your handout, it says, The hope of this earth is the glorious return of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. That's the hope of the earth. As you read through the Psalms, you see that theme over and over. The hope of the earth is the glorious return of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the last question that I want to consider before we go. And that's this. What's God's ultimate purpose for the earth and His for His creation? I mean... We know the Lord's going to return to the earth, but then what? What's his purpose? Psalm 8 has the answer, and it's a wonderful psalm that is often referred to in the New Testament. This is a very famous psalm, Psalm 8. Many writers in the New Testament refer back to Psalm 8, and it's about, a man, it's about someone called the Son of Man. And this Son of Man is crowned with glory and honor. And, and it's interesting the way the Psalms are laid out. And it's, it's just fascinating to me. And I, I hope it is to you. And I hope that, that, that you're getting this, that the Psalms are, are very prophetic, many of them, in nature. And they lay out for you what God's going to do with the earth and mankind and the heavens. And they lay out the future. They prophesy. And it's interesting the way many of these Psalms lay out. Because in Psalm 6, which we studied last week, what's going on? The righteous are suffering. They're being oppressed on the earth, which is pictured by David. And then in Psalm 7, the return of the Lord comes and judgment comes on the wicked on the earth. And then in Psalm 8, it starts out in verse 1 with, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So in Psalm 6, things are terrible and chaotic on planet earth. In Psalm 7, the Lord intervenes and returns. In Psalm 8, the Lord makes everything right Because the Lord returns and His name is exalted and it's glorified in all the earth. God has a glorious plan for this earth. And in your handout, it says God's plan is that the entire earth will center in and glorify His Son, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 11, 9. It's a great verse. And I want you to look at the screen and I'm going to bring it up. It says, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. This is a prophetic verse. For the earth shall be, future tense, one day the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I want you to follow me for just, there's not going to be anything to write here for a moment. And I want you to really follow this because this will bless your heart if you can get this. God gave mankind, represented through Adam, authority over the earth. He said, Adam, I want you to go out and I want you to subdue the earth. And I want you to be the governor of the earth. I want you to govern this earth in a way that will glorify the Lord, the Creator. Adam goes out, buys in to the marketing strategy of Satan. He fails miserably to to be the governor of this earth. And he believes the lies of Satan. Satan brings chaos and confusion and rebellion to the earth, which was his idea and plan. But here's the deal. One day, Satan's rule is going to be subdued. And the earth, listen now, the earth and all, even the lower creation, plant life, animal life, all of the lower creation, along with mankind, is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption that sin brought into this world. That's what Romans 8 teaches in verses 21 and 22. All of creation had a curse brought upon it. Not just mankind. 
All of creation was affected by Adam's sin. The earth, the soil, the, the plant life, animal life, all of it had this curse brought upon it because of the entrance of sin into this universe and into this earth. And Psalm 8 is a prophetic psalm that tells us how God is going to accomplish the subduing of Satan. And he's going to subdue him and he's going to take the earth and subdue the earth. How's God going to accomplish it? He's going to do it through someone called the Son of Man. Now, can anybody tell me what, what, who in the Bible has that title, Son of Man? Jesus Christ. That's right. He's the Son of God, but He's also called the Son of Man. Why? Because He was fully God and He was fully man. Now, when you see, when you see Son of God, that's going to be a reference to the fact that He's deity. Okay? But whenever you see Son of Man, that title, that is going to refer to Christ's legal right to, to come and to take full control and authority of this earth. Whenever you see Son of Man, it's dealing with Christ having that legal right to come and take full authority and full control of the earth. You say, why? Here's why. In your handout, it says that the governorship of this earth was given to man. It was given to Adam. And he lost it. He allowed a usurper to come and take it from him. And Satan became the prince of this world. And the governorship of the earth was given to man. It was his responsibility. And he lost it. And it says in your handout, only man can gain it back. And this is where I want you to do something for me. Put your bookmarker in Psalms. Will you do that right now? Put it in Psalms. And I want you to go to the New Testament towards the back of your Bible to the book of Hebrews. I think I've even got the page number if you're using the Pew Bible here on the screen. Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. And I want to show you this, is, this chapter in the New Testament quotes Psalm 8. So these two, these two passages go hand in hand. Now, here's the thing. And once you get there, if I can just have your attention a moment. If mankind lost that governorship of this earth to Satan, and only man can get it back because that, that's who God gave it to is mankind. He said that God made a choice that mankind is going to be the one to subdue and govern the earth. Well, he blew it. So if only man can get it back, where does that leave us? Because, I mean, think about it. We're all sinners. We've all come up short of the glory of God. I mean, if only man can get it back, if only man can correct what mankind did, okay, back in the beginning, and if only man can get that back, and we've all sinned, and we've all come short of the glory of God, then then what hope do we have? This is where it gets real good, okay? Okay. Are you all with me this morning? Okay. This is where it really, really gets good. God became flesh. And Christ was made a little lower than the angels, Psalm 8, 5 said. You say, how was Christ made lower than the angels? Look at Hebrews 2 and verse 9. It says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels... Well, how was he made lower than the angels? For the suffering of what? Get that in your handout. For the suffering of death. You say, what does that mean? Angels are spirits. They can't die. Angels are spirits, the Bible says. They can't die. Jesus was made lower than the angels. How? For the suffering of death. He was given a physical, fleshly body that could die. And in fact, did die. So only man can get back what man lost. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. So, so this world that's to come where righteousness will prevail, he said the angels can't bring it in. They can't do it. Verse 6. But one in a certain place testified saying, what is man? There's the key. It's got to be man. What is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest? Him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. How was Christ made lower than the angels? Talk to me now. Think. Use that head now. How, how was he made lower than the angels? For the suffering of death. death. Angels can't die. 
Christ was given, he said, a body thou hast prepared me. He was given a body. In fact, if you look on down there, look at verse um, 14. Okay, It says, Therefore, as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, Christ, took part of the same. He took our flesh and blood. That which an angel could never do. He took our flesh and blood. That through death, see, it was so that he could die. Through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hey, folks, listen. Christ died. He was given a body that could die. He was made lower than the angels. But you know what the good news is? And we don't have to wait till Easter to say it. Christ didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. He defeated death and thereby defeated Satan. He ascended up to heaven. And in your handout it says, When he ascended to heaven, he was granted all power and authority. He was the risen one. He had conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. He he conquered Satan. And so he ascends up to heaven. And if you look down there at verse 7, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And did set him over the works of thy hands. He ascends up to heaven. And he is the only one worthy. He is the one in which all power and all authority is now placed in his hands. But you know what? Hebrews 2.8 is a key, key verse that you need to understand. Look at it. Hebrews 2.8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Okay? All things have been put under the subjection of Christ's feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that's not put under him. Oh, wait wait a minute. It doesn't end there, though. Look at the next phrase. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Key verse. Have all things been placed under Christ's subjection? Yes. Positionally, everything is under his authority. But yet he says all things haven't been brought under his authority yet. Just read the morning newspaper and you can see that. Okay? Read the morning newspaper. Have all things been brought under his authority yet? No. Hebrews says no. Not yet. Positionally they are. In a practical level, no. It's kind of like if you became the boss at work. Positionally all things are under your authority now. But practically, on a practical level, it'd probably take you a lot of time to get things the way you want it. So, so while everything's under your authority, okay, all things that are under you haven't been brought under your authority, and everything's not where you want it to be. Well, Christ has ascended. He's been crowned with glory and honor in heaven. You say, well then, if He's got the legal right to come back as the Son of Man and to regain what the first man lost, Adam... Then why doesn't he come, Pastor Dan? Why doesn't he come and and take control of this earth as he promised that he would? All I can tell you is this. God is allowing wickedness to continue on this earth in order that mankind may have time to turn to him and be saved. Sometimes Christians get the attitude, I just wish Christ would come back and would just judge all the ungodly and bring righteousness on the earth. How many of you have lost loved ones that don't know Christ as your Savior? Do you realize what you're saying? Do you realize what you're saying? You see, as long as Christ delays His coming to this earth as the lion, that means people have an opportunity to experience the grace of God and be forgiven of all their sins. If you bring that timeline chart up, I think it's at the end there. But if you go ahead and bring that up, you'll notice on this timeline chart, and and I want you to look at it closely, because here you have the cross work of Christ, where He died for all mankind. And then He ascends up to heaven, to where He's crowned with glory and honor. Okay. Meanwhile, there's still chaos down here. If He's up here been crowned with glory and honor, and positionally all things have been put under Him up here then why doesn't he come back down here and go ahead and take control of this earth and bring righteousness to this planet and straighten things out? I'll tell you exactly why. The only reason he doesn't come back, and remember, he's going to bring the wickedness of the wicked to an end. He's going to judge the ungodly. I'll tell you the only reason why he hasn't done that. 
It's right here. What's that word? Grace. Grace. He's offering His grace today to sinners. He's not judging sinners today. He's offering grace to sinners. And He's giving mankind a chance and space to turn to Him. Oh, He'll deal with the ungodliness. Oh, He's going to deal with sinners. He's going to deal with the wicked. He's going to bring this earth into the subjection that it needs to be under His rule. He's going to do that. Notice the line goes up to, up to heaven, but then what does the line do? It continues and it comes where? It comes back down to earth. One day He's going to reveal Himself at the revelation to all the world. And He's going to come as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In fact, in your handout, it says, One day this rejected king, who's been crowned with glory and honor in heaven, he's going to return to this earth as the Son of Man. He's going to come back as the second man to do what the first man was supposed to do but failed. He's going to do what Adam was supposed to do but failed. You say, wait a minute. The Bible calls Adam the first man and it calls Jesus the second man. Why? There were a lot of men in between Adam and Christ. Here's why. Because Adam was the first man in a line of men that would be just like him. They would be sinners. And from Adam came a line of people in which death, decay, corruption would all come upon them just like Adam. Christ is the second man. From Him comes a line of people who have put their faith in Him with life, immortality, and incorruption. You either come from the first man or now you come from the second man, Jesus Christ. And in your handout, last statement, Christ is going to bring His glory and His honor to this earth. And He's going to establish a righteous and a just kingdom on this earth. The wicked will be punished and righteousness and justice will prevail. And creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Go back to Psalm 8 and I'm just going to read you a couple verses here and we'll be done. Look at Psalm 8 and it describes this future blessed state. Psalm 8 verse 5. Psalm 8, verse 5. Okay, look at it with me. It says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, Christ, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. That happened after his resurrection and ascension. But then notice what's going to happen ultimately. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. That's creation. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. Where? In all the earth. Aren't you looking forward to that day? You know, I'm going to read this and I'm done. In Isaiah 11, it describes this, this, this kingdom. If you bring up the screen again, the timeline... This passage that I'm about to read describes right here when Christ comes back to the earth, that curse will be lifted from off of creation, from off of that, that, that curse of sin will be lifted. And listen to this description. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Okay, that's Christ. And a branch, capital B, that's Christ, shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord, listen, when he comes back here, It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it says, it shall make him of quick understanding. And then it says, with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Listen to this. This describes the lower creation. This is wild. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Won't want to eat them anymore. Says they're going to lie with them. And the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. He won't be violent and aggressive anymore. And listen to this. This is wild. In this time period when that curse is lifted and Christ comes back, 
He's the hope of the earth, folks. And it says here, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. That's a snake. Any of you want to go out and play on the hole of a snake? Won't be a big deal at all in the kingdom. It says, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. That's, that's the snake, snake's den. And then listen to this. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As you look around at the wickedness of the world, you think, this earth is a mess. Where's God? Don't be discouraged. God has a glorious plan, and He invites men and women to participate with Him in His plan. And today, we are living right here in a time of decision. And the decision is, will you place your faith in Jesus Christ, in His plan, what He said He's going to do? Will you put your faith in Him, dying for your sins? Or will you reject Him and believe Satan's word? We live in a time of decision. God graciously invites men and women to participate with Him in His glorious plan of ultimate glorification of His Son through the earth and through the heavens. Will you be a part of that plan? Well, I hope so.